time for Cutting Edge Consciousness with Freeman Michaels and Barnett Bain. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here. With Barnett Bain. Good moment, everyone. Good moment. How are you feeling? I feel fabulous. I did not feel so fabulous <laughs> for the first uh, couple of weeks, but I'm now about a month in. All right, so we have to cl- cl- clue everybody in. So we had, I don't know, two months ago or so, uh, Beth Meisner, who's a friend of yours, on Beth the Meisner, show. Beth Meisner, Ivan Meisner. Ivan Meisner, uh, who's been on before. In a different topic. Yeah. And um, there is a food plan that they uh, worked with with him to uh, shift, um, I don't know, is that the right word? Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer, and so they uh, went about looking at possible alternatives to the most dramatic alternative, the Western medicine alternative, and they did a massive change in his diet and had remarkable results. Remarkable, remarkable results. And anyway, so I, um, he was on the show, but I, I had spent some time with them a little bit before that, and I was just, I'm blown away. I am fortunately very, very healthy, but I was blown away by the vitality and just the the uh the healthfulness the aliveness um in him in both of them yeah and i've known them for quite a few years i knew them before uh when they ate like me and <laughs> looked like me and uh, and we thought everything was fine yeah that's right um and so i've known them for quite some time and i was so um, blown away and so impressed mm at uh, how alive Hmm. they are, that um, I thought, well, I am 61 years old, and as I said, I'm grateful to be healthy. Hmm. I'm so grateful to be healthy. And uh, I also, I I make it a point of embracing change. I I like to change it all up every now and then uh, again. You know, I mentioned to you, I think about selling my house. I love the house. I've been in it for 26 years, 28 years. I love it. And and maybe it's time to just rediscover myself. I love it. And so I love cake and I love um, greasy food. You're just not I, eating any. I just love it. And maybe it's time yes. to, I'm not putting a bunch of value judgments on it. I'm not becoming like a reformed smoker. Right. I did that too. <laughs> so <laughs> that I was just, a few decades maybe it's ago. time to just switch it all up. Um, uh, well, and, I and love the story of you because uh, you didn't quit smoking. You just topped stopped. out. Yeah, just there just stopped. became a point where you realized smoking two packs a day was not going to be the way you wanted to live your life. It didn't fit with your vision for I yourself. I didn't make it a struggle. It wasn't yeah. a bunch of percentages. I wasn't seeking balance. I wasn't trying to. I just said, you know, for who I am and what I am right now, this is uh, not how I want to be. Although it certainly had its uh, self-medicating pleasures. And I had a very similar, ver- I had a love affair with food. Hmm. I still have a love affair with food. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to choose yes. to change my life in ways that uh, might be more supportive for who I am in my early 60s. And, and, and feel better. Look, this is, you know, my lifelong challenges and, and I have a very addictive experience with food. I mean, I get really wacky in the way I, I handle it. Um, so we've talked many times about these periods where I take 30 days off of sugar, for example. Sure. That's what I'm doing right now. Why only 30 days? I mean, it seems well, to me that once you've done 30 days of detox, you've done the heavy lifting. Why would you go back? Well, here's the thing. I will say this, that um, a big part of my experience is this depriving. Um, My mother was a health nut growing up. So we were constantly going on these very extreme swings, like we became vegetarians for a year or something. And the whole family was. And so there were these very, very... um, crazy, feels crazy, uh, swings from one extreme to another. Mm -hmm. And so I've always had this kind of relationship with not wanting to get that way, right? So So it wasn't really, if I understand you, correct me if I'm misunderstanding you, it wasn't really uh, an adult choice made integrated from the inside out. You were exposed early to uh, all kinds of um, of diets by fiat. Yes. uh, And that were never really backed up. She wasn't making them from the inside out. She was always on to the next thing. Always. 
Yeah. Still is to yeah. this day. So uh, that's an important distinction to make, you know, whether it's, uh, it, it's in your diet or your relationships or your behaviors of any kind. Um, there, you know, we, we mature, we grow, uh, well, hopefully word, we season. The word was graceful. This, the, the, uh, the, the words you used when you described the transition for smoking, and even this, there's an element of grace. It's just a point in time where, okay, this is the most appropriate choice for me, versus this kind of white knuckling it. I have to change. No, I've got to fix. I don't, I'm, Unfortunately, it's it isn't um, a response or a reaction to anything. I like to precipitate as a part of my spiritual practice. Mm. I like to have, I like to invite crises so that they are positive crises of right. growth and change, <laughs> right. rather than uh, crises where too much is coming at me too fast and and. and it just swamps my ability to respond. I like to invite a uh, change, and uh, I can s bend and lean into it at my own pace and discover who I am on the other side. So this has been quite some time now, I'm, and I'm feeling great and, and, and very, very alive. And it's wonderful. So we happen to have no uh, coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should mention Funny that. Funny you should, should mention uh, this. So I have my friend Ocean Robbins uh, with us joining us today. Ocean, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Ocean, he's the CEO of the Food Revolution Network and, and an adjunct professor of peace studies at Chapman University in Southern California. And he is with us this day, this moment. On cutting edge consciousness, well, Ocean. Welcome to the show, Ocean. Well, I'm I'm so glad to be with you, and I think this is a fascinating topic. You know, I've often reflected that that the, the when, when we want to reward kids, we give them candy. When we want to celebrate birthdays in our society, we have cake. Weddings, we celebrate with cake. Special occasions, and and we think we're giving ourselves a treat when we when we consume sugary, honestly, junk foods. And I, I wonder how different it would be if we could rewire our brains so that instead of saying, oh, I'm going to give myself a treat, I'm going to eat this stuff, I'm, we said, oh, I'm going to, you know, this is going to give me increased chance of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, and make me feel like crap for the rest of the day, uh, we'd probably be less likely to consume it. So what if we associate eating broccoli and cabbage and fresh vegetables with loving ourselves and caring for ourselves and even treating ourselves? I, th I think we'd have a very different that's world. A, that's a very different um, paradigm altogether. And for those of us, uh, you know, I believe that th these things, like all things, are developmental. And to, uh, to, to shift a reward system uh, from cake to broccoli is... Um, not really, uh, not really uh, practical. <laughs> my, my kids aren't going to go. For however, it. however, <laughs> my nine and eleven year old yeah. aren't uh, giving back their Halloween candy. However, it begs a, a whole different uh, examination underneath it because that we are conditioned uh, to respond this way to uh, rewarding those I, we love with. Um, with medications, and let's face it, food is medication. Yeah. That we are, we that we reward our children with medications rather than with uh, affirming who they are, rather than with um, taking them by the shoulders and looking them straight in the eye and saying, "I love that you did this," but um, just so you know, it's not what you do. I love it's who you are. Mm -hmm. There is a, a systemic. Um, uh, disconnect, of, uh, I think, or, or to put it more positively, I think we are growing, uh, uh, we are developing, we are moving into an entirely different perspective on how to uh, handle life and how to relate to life and those that we care for in our life. And uh, in that, from that perspective, um, we will not so be so quick to use uh, extr extrinsic stuff, whether it's um, cars or bakery or or um, or money. sugary drinks mm -hmm. or money as ways to validate each other. Exactly, it's true. And and at whatever age we are now, we have a choice. You know, however however we were raised, whatever conditioning we had, we have a choice about how we condition ourselves today. And I think it's completely possible that we can bring more association with healthy foods around self-love and self-care. Yeah. Well, and and, the, and, and the, that, that has a profound impact. Yeah, the, the critical word is choice. 
is it a point of choice? And that is what I think Barnett was saying with developmental. There is a point in time where there's a consciousness, someone develops a consciousness to say, wait a minute, I want to make a choice here. You know, I want to choose how I want to relate to, in, in my case, even some of the addictive patterns. My reaction to the very strict, sort of austere way that food was handled in my home growing up uh, caused a kind of reaction from me because I didn't go through the developmental stage that a lot of kids did. I didn't get to eat sugar cereal. So when I hit college, you know, guess what I ate morning, noon, and night? <laughs> sugar cereal. You know, of yeah. course I did because that was the reaction. So there is a place of choice where it's. Uh, Barnett, you talked about this with the, the the desire to dominate versus having some level of dominion over you know something. And it's developmental. It you it grows. We we dominate uh, until we learn that there are other responses to life. But until mm. such time, the idea that there might be another response to life is absurd. You know, to a to a, a, a set of whole numbers two four six eight. The idea that there could be an uneven number. Is or absurd. even a fraction. <laughs> and the, to people, to, and, and uh, Ocean, I want you to comment further on this. It seems to me that for those of us who have uh, lived in the bubble of big food, mm. um, it is absolutely natural that, um, that processed foods, everything except that which is around the walls of the grocery uh, store, everything in the middle <laughs> right. of the grocery everything in the middle of the grocery right. store yeah. is um, uh, processed and has cocktails of chemicals and preservatives and colorings and uh, all sorts of things. And until we come to experience firsthand that um, firsthand that, those foods uh, have an impact on our bodies until we actually put that together firsthand and can weigh the difference between what happens when I eat those and what happens when I am eating um, and developing a taste for uh, whole foods. Um, it is not real. It's just, a, it's just an intellectual discussion. And, and, yeah, and not everybody is, is going to come to make that connection. Uh, everyone will come to it in their own timing, and some will never come to it, and that's okay. Well, it's Unfortunate, true, and, but okay. And, uh, and a lot of folks are suffering and dying. Yes. And this is, this is the thing that I see in my work all the time. It, it, it breaks my heart how often we wait until we have cancer or, or our life is really on the line before we're willing to make changes, and sometimes it's too late. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, it, but, but we feel invincible. We feel immortal in some way, and, and the reality is that that a lot of uh, the processed foods that we see today have been designed by extremely smart people for maximal stomach share. Yeah. You know, they want to own our craveability factor. And they have what was that word? The, the, craveability. the craveability factor. Uh, the craveability factor. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They, they've designed these products for m the perfect texture, the perfect sweetness, the perfect uh, tartness, all with chemicals that fool our bodies. You know, our bodies love sweet things because... You know, when, when the wild fruit is ripe when it's sweet. We love fatty things because when we didn't have enough calories down through most of our history, fat contained more calories per gram. Uh, and when, but when food was about survival, that made perfect sense. And what's happened is that we went from food 1.0, which is survival, to food 2.0, which is commerce, and now we have to evolve to food 3.0, which makes health the central organizing principle of our food system, or uh, I think we're, we're pretty doomed. I mean, when you look at the data of our, our medical care spending and how many of us are suffering and how many kids have diabetes today, you know, we've, we've got some serious problems, and the status quo isn't going to get us where we need to go if we really want to be healthy and thriving. And, and, and I hear that, and I, th and I absolutely agree. Maybe the 3.0 is sort of back to what Barnett and I were talking about choice. The... Because, you know, look, one of the, 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 the third of the options, right? So um, the, the, the challenge when there's a recognition that what I'm eating is killing me. Um, because there's something extreme that's happened. Diabetes is set in, cancer is set in, whatever. The, 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 there is a, I ought to be eating, I should be eating, which at that point doesn't feel like the most empowered choice. I mean, it might be just based on the sheer circumstances one has created for themselves, but so often folks don't do it, 
right? The, 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 the person that comes in is overweight, who's pre-diabetic, and the doctor says to them, look, if you keep eating this way, you're going to develop diabetes. And two years later, they come in and they've got full-blown diabetes, and everyone's like, well. But that person, developmentally, wasn't at a place where they could make a choice, right? So there is a shift here from my perspective where we're victims of a system, and we are, so I'm not diminishing that, that has us by the short hairs. That's true until it's not. Do you know what I'm talking about? Until there's well, a point where I can make another choice, where I can shop around the perimeter you're talking of about the cut, store. Yeah, really about, uh, I think what I hear you saying is that uh, food, like everything else, is a consciousness totally, issue. Totally, totally, 100%. Well, I'm right with you. And, you know, the question is, we, we have to face the fact that we've been lied to, in a sense. Not, not by somebody who was specifically trying to, like, you know, mean us ill, but we've been lied to by uh, so, so, social norms yeah. that aren't good enough. We can do better, and because we can do better, we have to do better. And as individuals, we get the choice, you know, whether we want to unconsciously perpetuate uh, norms that, that may be toxic for us, or whether, as we become aware, as we become informed, we want to live into, lean into, bringing more ownership over the choices that we make. Ultimately, it's about your own empowerment. It's about your own authorship of your life. And yes. you know, I think that's the beauty of it. It is a consciousness thing. It, it, and, you know, it, it can be painful sometimes to face the fact that we're surrounded by and in, inundated by norms that turn out to be toxic. Um, and, but, and the and, but it can also be liberating. Yes, and the navigating of that is incredibly empowering. And as we've sort of said so far on the show, and we've said before in the past, that the developmental, where I begin to take ownership, and as and not to again, not to not recognize that the deck is loaded. You know that it's stacked against us. I get it, but given that. How do I respond in the most empowered way? Listen, we need to take a quick break, so I, I want you to comment on that, but we'll do that. Grab a bite. Yeah, grab a bite. <laughs> <laughs> grab a soda pop. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, grab do, some kale, do, do, and we will be right, right back kale. after we have some words uh, from, from our, our good sponsors. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. We are back with Ocean Robbins, CEO of the Food Revolution Network. Uh, and something um, struck me. Can I can I jump right in? Yeah, this is a, jump. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. This just hit me. <clears throat> we did an amazing show. I don't know, maybe six months ago, um, about the. Um, uh, the, oh, I just blanked on it. The Pentagon and the whole, what was it called again? Uh, strategy. Grand, grand strategy. Grand strategy. So there's a think tank in, in D.C. And there are some folks there who are working on a grand strategy uh, around uh, sustainability as the new growth industry. Um, and it really struck me like, wow, that is really neat that sustainability in their minds is the new growth industry uh, as an empowered response to uh, the mess we've made, right? Uh, whole, and whole food is a pillar. That's where I'm running to. That is a oh, pillar of, uh, um, of that um, grand strategy well, and being it, formulated by, largely by the, by the Pentagon. And so what I love about it is it empowers people to make choices and, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically organics. Specifically, it also points out, as Ocean just said, that the... Uh, the uh, the current model is calamitous and it is. unsustainable, it is. and uh, it will lead to. Uh, it is already leading to a systemic health breakdown. Uh, it's leading to a uh, breakdown of our um, uh, our the soils, and you know they're 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 toxic and overly fertilized, and too many phosphates, and so. But, they, all but, sorts but, that, but that gets really loud. I'm not diminishing that. Again, I, I totally recognize that. But again, at the level of how do we empower people to make choices, to, to stem the tide. That's where why we have choice. Ocean Robbins on yeah, the show. That's the game. Because <laughs> I, just, I, just, I don't want to just wag my finger at the diabetes guy who doesn't know how to change his diet, doesn't have the support system. And, that, and has know. no access because lives in a food desert and totally. is 40 right. miles to the, to the nearest vegetable. Exactly. So, so instead of wagging my finger, 
anger at that guy? How do I empower him to make wiser choices? So it's not, you know, again, just playing into the victim story, but really helping people say, this isn't the world I want to create. And individuals, as individuals, then forming into collectives, moving towards different choices. Right. Well, this is why we need a food revolution. Because we do have systemic problems. We have subsidies that are making Snickers cheaper and more accessible than spinach. We have a commodity system. Our government uh, in the U.S. literally contributes tens of billions of dollars to subsidizing uh, high fructose corn syrup and, you know, the junkiest foods that we know are bad for us, right? And uh, so in that context, we do need systemic change. We do need to make healthy foods more accessible and more affordable to everybody. And the beautiful thing is that you don't have to wait for Monsanto or McDonald's or Coca-Cola or the U.S. government to create your own food revolution. You can step into it one step at a time from wherever you're at, and you don't have to make uh, perfection the goal. You make progress the goal. It's momentum. It's about taking a step and then taking another step, building healthier habits one day at a time, one step at a time, and actually watching your taste buds change. I mean, I've got kids, 13-year-old twins. They came back from summer camp and complained they didn't serve enough vegetables at camp. And, you know, people oh, look at Ocean, me like, well, I, your kids eat vegetables? Ocean, I had an apple yesterday and, uh, after a month of uh, no sugar whatsoever. I had an apple, and it was really too much for me. Mm. Yeah. My, yeah. Well, my, my kids go to grandma's house, which for them isn't as oppressive because it's not their regular thing. In fact, when they're at grandma's house, they love her food, which I'm always scratching my head going, well, that doesn't fit with my story. But they do. And it's all, you know, like they, they have a they, the, weekly they get vegetables dropped off from the from a local farmer. This is up in the Bay Area. Uh, and they they're really my mom is crazy about the whole thing a little more than I'm comfortable with. But I love that my kids are really cool with it. I think Barnett yeah. actually goes back to they're getting all the hugs. Grandma gives them so much attention that the food, even though there, there are no sweets, um, it is a reflection of the love they're getting. And there's an associative quality where it is broccoli and it is some fruit for dessert. And the kids are, are, are pleased. Well, with this it. is a big piece. And I, you know, again, I, I invite you to comment on this ocean so much. It is one thing to, um, to um, retrofit uh, the mm. food habits of adults, mm. but for, I, for young children, when, uh, when it is storied, when it, when it is presented in a context that is uh, loving, yeah, that uh, that that is everything, right? That is well, the whole deal. Yeah, and you can't isolate food from relationships. I mean, Say more. I mean, when 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 people associate food with love, then that's one thing. When they associate food with rules and dogmas and shoulds and shouldn'ts and judgment, then that's another thing. That's good. So how do we bring love and consciousness and care into our relationship with food, both personally and then also for our family members? That's so that they awesome. they experience healthy food not as deprivation or rigidity or a bunch of rules that they can't follow, but rather as love and care. And, and when we do that, then the whole relationship is deepened. Yeah, you know, my challenge is, uh, and again, most of us are working out stuff from our history, as am I, um, is that I don't want to be my mother. But again, I don't also want to, you know, have my kids eating, you know, junk. Your mother's the on the other line, actually. <laughs> she <laughs> she might call my mother. Is, that, might, is that Freeman's mother? Let's put her through. Might, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> uh, there might be some finger wagging going on. No, um, <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> what the heck was I trying to say? Oh, I well, this is it, is that I, I don't want to deprive them, you know, and so I want to create outlets. And this is my little confession. On vacation, uh, we let the kids eat the sugared cereal because sometimes we'll go to a hotel and they'll have it. And if they don't have it, we buy it. Like, But it's the only time we let them have it. Um, but it, it is this kind of thing where I don't want them so I'm curious. sneaking cookies under their bed because we've outlawed them in the, in the house. No, but you create an environment where this is the forbidden fruit. Yeah, you got big problems. That's you, my story. Which, so you know, if you're you're not saying well, you uh, you know you're not saying oh, on vacation we allow them to eat arsenic. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope not. So there's there's uh, there's a mystique that is created around uh, around these products. Yeah, it's very very subtle. Uh, so I'm certainly not finger wagging, but uh, yeah. well, I haven't figured it out. This is a tricky one. How do you? How well, do you your ride grandmother's that? Fi your mother's figured it out. You can get her off the line now. <laughs> <laughs> your mother, your mother's figured it out. She they eat everything that she that she puts in front of them because she loves them. Yeah, and yeah. she doesn't she doesn't feel that she has to make uh, that she has to reward 
Um, you get to do something special now and um, and uh, have crack. You get a cookie, yeah. Well, and it, it sounds like maybe she, it's easier for her as a grandmother than it was for her as a mother. Totally. totally. And this 100%. is common because she's not, grandmothers aren't trying to shape. It's easier for me as love, a grandfather you know? than it was for me as a father, and, and I don't have any grandchildren. <laughs> he's, <laughs> yeah. he's warming up to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, one of the big realities with kids is they don't have an immune system to protect them against the lures of the food industry. They don't, they don't have the capacity to understand the data. And so, of course, if something tastes good and it's being celebrated all around them, they're going to like it. Hmm. And so one of the things we have to do, I think, as parents um, is to, to the best of our ability, protect our kids from certain dangers. I mean, you're not going to give your kid heroin, I hope, even though they'd probably like it, right? Well, the, I mean, cha- the challenge is that sugar is just as addictive as, as heroin. Yeah, it is. So it's and really so, problematic because on some level you kind of are giving them heroin. I mean, I have that relationship with sugar where it's very addictive for me where I have to take periods off so I can feel like I'm recalibrating so that I've got my chooser back. Yeah, exactly. And so I, in our parenting journey, I mean, we did our best just, you know, when our kids were little not to expose them to a lot of the stuff that was normal. And if they went to a birthday party, honestly, we'd, we'd bring our, they'd bring their own cake with them, you know? And... Uh, and that could be challenging. There's no perfect way to handle it. I'm happy right now. That's, but our kids that's a Northern California thing, folks. Medium. Our listeners um, right now are going, hmm, they bring their, um, that's, a, that's a Northern California. You can get away <laughs> with that in Santa Cruz. Not so much in Beverly Hills. <laughs> 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 well, and I have an and to this. So I have an older son, my stepson, who's now 25. He was 10 when we met. And uh, Jasmine and I really worked to reverse some of the patterns that were set before her and I became a couple, right, with her ex and the way that that, that, that side of the family handled food. Um, thankfully, now at 25, he's got into his own kind of health kick. So I'm kind of back to, you know, the developmental piece where, you know, it's I want to float it out there as an option. Uh, with, with little kids, yes, we, you know, let, let's be clear on what we are allowing and not allowing and, and, and have some flexibility so we don't create forbidden foods. Um, it's just so murky, but I'm just saying that there is at the end, I think, this uh, the sense of domain versus dominance where I can relate to choices and make them at the developmental stage I'm at. Yeah, I like that, you know, domain versus dominance, you know, how, how and how do we how do we bring honestly, I think it's also about integrity um, between our own values, what we want for our lives and for ourselves and our choices. And that's developmental, too, because there's a point at which we don't have that, that wisdom right. necessarily because we're just doing what the kid next door does, and that's all we really care about is the great God normal. This is what little kids at certain stages are doing, right? It's so right. challenging. <laughs> the, the matter is so complex, uh, and it's so challenging. Uh, we have a tendency as human beings to want to make, um, uh, to want to corral all of the messy bits into a straight line and, mm. and uh, I have a bottom line to everything. I travel the country a great deal and uh, I can tell you I see, and I know um, this won't be unfamiliar to you, uh, Ocean, I, I see people in small towns and, and cities sometimes uh, and they are, they're barely able to make ends meet, if at all able to make ends meet. And sometimes yeah. the end of the month, um, uh, no, nobody's eating anything. They're eating ketchup uh, in water for soup and waiting for the next, uh, the next um, uh, check at the beginning of the month. Yep. And to feed a child, um, you can feed a child on, on sugar and, um, and cereals and pop. You can at least put um, substance yeah. into Calories. into hungry bellies. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, for the price of uh, one salad, you can you can put two weeks of sugar into somebody. Yeah, and and you know, for for about half the people in the United States right now, we are either at that point or on the edge. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, we have a we have a huge portion of our population right now that is paycheck to paycheck, you know, month to month, has no savings. And, uh, and even debt with credit card bills. And, you know, in that reality, it's tough, especially when you're working 60 hours a week, you know, which a lot of people are today. Yes, yes. And so, you know, what I want to say is I totally, yeah, I get that. And um, my, uh, I also want to put out that with some planning, 
and some preparation, it is possible. It's not that expensive to, you know, soak beans for 24 hours, to get all the gassy stuff and then cook them and beans and rice and cabbage and carrots and onions. These are not high priced things. They're actually cheaper than McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at calories, the, the, the really scary thing is that a lot of people who are on the edge financially wind up getting too many calories. Um, because of, and the wrong kind of calories, and our, you know, our nutrients are deficient. Our bodies are screaming for more nutrition, so we keep filling up our bellies with more calories, and not realizing that actually, we're, you know, we're getting obese. I mean, obesity rates are highest amongst our poorest populations. True. So, um, as are rates of cancer and heart disease and diabetes yeah. and many other diet-related illnesses. So there is a huge social justice dimension to our food crisis. And, um, you know, what I want to say for all listeners who are struggling day to day is that, um, you know, this, that you do have the opportunity to reclaim your food. And part of what it's going to take is putting in the time and thought to not eat out. Uh, you know, if you're eating out, no question, McDonald's is the cheapest way to go, um, calorie for calorie. But you have the option to, you know, if you can condition your taste buds to be okay with it, you know, to adjust to a whole food diet and actually save money uh, and definitely give yourself more energy and vitality long term. And there are secrets. There are many, many secrets to, um, to um, remodulating our taste buds. There's all, you know, a very few of us have, um, because of the way we have been raised in the food culture in which we've raised, very few of us in this country have any appreciation of the uh, the magic and the mysteries of the spice rack. Um, you begin to discover the spices that um, that can be um, put to um, vegetables and um, foods that we have less familiarity with. I, you know, over the last um, a few weeks now, I have um, fallen into a love affair with curry powder in my spinach soup. So every time I have that soup, it feels like I'm in the most wonderful Indian experience. Mm, and nice. turmeric and cumin and it's just, it's just uh, it's so, it can be so exotic. I mean, there's uh, all kinds of well, there, subtleties. There, there's a, so one of the things that this brings me back to, my, my friend Lisa Fontanesi, who does the, she goes into schools and creates gardens with them and does it uh, as part of the curriculum, learning to grow the food and learn about the food. Because this is a big uh, piece of the puzzle is again, we're so disconnected from the food. You know, doesn't chicken come from, you know, a package? You know, doesn't it come frozen with breaded already? Uh, what about vegetables? You know, it comes from the fryer. Right. So yeah. the idea that zucchini doesn't come deep fried and breaded, that you actually grow it and this is what it really looks like is a, a huge piece of the puzzle. And we talked about, you know, what's behind the food. Uh, Lisa's big thing is if the kids are growing it, they're excited about it. And then now they get to be an expert in food, which makes them empowered in a particular way. So maybe you can speak to that piece of the puzzle as well. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things is that I think there are many studies showing that kids who are involved in growing food are more likely to want to eat that food. So getting people involved in agriculture is a wonderful thing. And it's one of the hopeful signs is right now more than half the people in the United States are involved in growing something in their home or backyard. And, uh, you know, that, that's been going up. And actually, a lot of millennial generation, you know, young folks, are increasingly interested in growing food. You know, the average age of our actual farmers in this country, people for whom growing food is a profession, you know, is in the 60s. Um, but we have more and more folks. That's a good age. <laughs> that's exciting. You know, he sees a, he sees a career opportunity. That's a great age. It is. It totally is. <laughs> and we definitely need some some fresh blood taking an interest in growing food too, right? Yeah. And, yeah but I think uh, I think Barnett would get, look good in the overalls with the uh, <laughs> the hoe out there in a corn cob pipe. <laughs> it would. It would. <laughs> well, no you, question about it. <laughs> um, so so I'm excited to see younger folks getting engaged and people of all economic backgrounds. I mean, Detroit uh, has the highest number of community gardens of any city per capita in the United States. Yeah. And partly we've got a lot of vacant lots, and we've got a lot of poverty, and we've got a lot of unemployment. And so what are folks doing? Sometimes they're putting two and two together, and they're taking some of the space from abandoned homes and some of the time they've got with unemployment, and they're putting it into growing food for the community. And, uh, you know, these are the kinds of creative solutions that sometimes are born out of crisis. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, we're, you know, wherever we are, whatever financial resources and health resources or challenges we face, we all have opportunities to engage in the food revolution. And when we do, you know, we're immeasurably healthier and happier. I love it. What I love about this conversation is we, you know, we touched on everyone's affected. You know, Barnett, 61, no grandkids, adult children, is talking about his experience. I'm talking about my younger kids' experience. And we're talking about then a whole nother realm where you're talking about people in poverty and where they're at. So this conversation extends way beyond. It's so personalized. It's so it's so for us to take on the conversation in whatever way is most empowering you know because it's it's everyone's going to have their version of this conversation or, or not but but the opportunity is to have the conversation and the conversation waits for you at the edge of where you are right now exactly it's, it waits for you yeah. so um where can our listeners learn more about uh, your work and the Food Revolution Network and wh- everything else that you're up to in the world? You're up to, s- to so many fabulous things. Well, thanks for asking, because I, I'm excited to share what we're doing. You can go to foodrevolution.org. Again, that's foodrevolution.org. You get a free Real Food Action Guide. You can join our email list and get action updates and tools. We have a blog with a lot of breaking news articles and tools and resources. And, uh, you know, we're here, to, we're here for the long haul. You know, we want, it. we want a food revolution in the world, and we also want to help you live the food revolution in your own life. And I'm also the author of a book called, um, if you, actually, if you go to foodrevolution.org slash getvoices, you can learn all about it. It's called Voices of the Food Revolution. It's available in bookstores or from Amazon.com. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank you for being in the food revolution in all the ways that you are, however it lives for you, every time you choose real food over processed crap, you're taking a stand for your life and you're taking a stand for a better world. And I'm, I'm here to celebrate that. Beautiful. With that, we're going to take a break. We invite you listeners uh, to hang on because Barnett and I will be back after these messages to wrap things up here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. Stay with us. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here with Barnett Bain. Um, you know, I brought up Lisa Fontanesi, who is a friend, um, but I should have also brought up Sam Polk, because he, of course, is doing grocery ships. And because it's his birthday Saturday. That's right. Woohoo! Happy, today, happy birthday! Because it's airing on Saturday. That's right. <laughs> happy it's birthday, his birthday. Sam Polk. Happy birthday today! Oh, uh, hope you're listening. Uh, yeah, no, his his work is amazing. I mean, this is the thing. There's so many people doing such amazing work. Again, you talked about Beth and Ivan Meisner and what they've you know figured out for themselves and are putting out in the world. Um, it's coming uh, in so many different forms. I actually love the part of it's a social justice issue. I thought that was brilliant. Brilliant that uh, Ocean brought up. Uh, it, it, it's so much. Uh, a valid conversation to be having in an empowered way because there is a way sometimes where it, what you said before about meeting people at the edge of what they can kind of handle, like meeting them where they're at versus um, a kind of lecture that it ought to be different, right? Or even sometimes the the kind of shrill of the... The finger wagging or the, the scolding wagging, yeah. or the judging or the, you're doing it wrong or, all of that stuff. And even some of the activism can can trip too far into just being, you know, uh, against versus really being for something. I mean, I think Ocean made that point. Look, there's good things happening. We're looking at, you know, poorer areas that are utilizing the open space, as it were, and and making something out of it. And there's and wealthier areas, too. Um, there is a, a was, there was a lot, a lot of fuss over the last few months in Berkeley. Oh, huge. The community garden up the there. The community garden that uh, is on a piece of dirt owned by UC uh, the UC Berkeley, and they wanted to put a, um, a structure on it. And, the mall. Uh, the, a mall. A mall. <laughs> the, community, uh, the community came out in force and said, we want this last piece of open space to be a community garden. We don't want a mall. And it was contentious. Uh, of course. And uh, I'm very happy to say that the uh, community prevailed there, and there is a gorgeous garden there. Uh, many, many people um, of all economic classes are feeding themselves. Mm. 
And um, I, I think the most important part is also... You have to drive now a whole extra block to get to the next mall. <laughs> That's probably part of it, too. Um, but it's this idea that kids are getting involved in growing something. You know, it does strike me uh, that that book, Last Child in the Woods, uh, there's something... It's a, dev- a child development book, but it, it, he calls it Nature Deficit. I don't disorder. know that book. It's a book about... Uh, how important it is to have the sort of wandering time in the woods, you know, the, 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 it's a reaction to kids who are kind of over-programmed, uh, too much, uh, screen time, either on, you know, video games or on television or on YouTube or whatever. Um, and, and how just getting out in the woods, letting kids play, letting them figure it out is such an important part of their development, right? Mm. Um, this is also part of it, too, is that we get so disconnected from our food source mm-hmm. that there's something to, even as an adult, putting my, my thumb in the ground and going, oh, right. There's something, forgive the expression, grounding, you know, about that. Like, oh, right, food. There's a connection to it, you know, that living in an in an urban, you know, in the urban boxes, it, it, that disconnect costs me something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, you're talking about when you were talking about um, the uh, affair that we have with our screens and with mm. our devices. I just saw something this morning uh, about Steve Jobs. And his relationship with his kids. He restricted it. He restricted their... Half half hour or something, a week or something. A week. Uh, He restricted them because he understood that it preempted that that kind of consistency and constancy on those screens preempted a developmentally appropriate brain function. That's right. Uh, And it's not that that brain, that piece of brain uh, parks and is developed later. What happens is that uh, the part of the brain that would normally mature later, that logical, linear, reasonable piece, uh, it just engages um, prematurely. Mm. And the part that um, would have uh, been engaged and developed and expressed earlier on, it's benched, forever Mm. benched. Yeah. So he understood that. There are some wonderful, wonderful writing on the subject by... Joseph Chiltern Pierce. Hmm. Oh, we should get on the show. He's still around and hmm. he's a lovely, uh, wise, wise elder. And his most famous book, A Crack in the Cosmic Egg. Oh, I love that book. That's uh, from like speaks, the 70s. Uh, before that, uh, um, hmm. he's, he speaks very, very uh, powerfully and uh, very, very authoritatively uh, around these issues. You know what I loved? I read that book not not that long ago, a couple of years ago, and he was using language, uh, specifically the word e, the term ESP, extrasensory perception, and that term fell out of vogue. But it's a great term to be acutely aware, extrasensory. Like there's a, it, it's such an appropriate conversation for today. It was popularized, of course. This is in the back sense. in the days when we thought we only had five senses. Yeah. And and just became sort of uh, unfashionable, and it's such an it's such a great word in the exploration. Uh, what was it's great to look back at um, a book like that. There was another book, Secret um, Life of Plants. Secret Life of Plants. Did you read my mind? Oh my God, I that's exactly actually, we had an right. SPSP moment. It was. That's another book that touches on that uh, whole. That is a very very uh, wise book and a very powerful book and a book that speaks directly to some of what we've been speaking about on the show today. Absolutely. And yet, uh, it speaks about it with an urgency then, and I was, that must have been 1979, uh, 78, 79, when, uh, when I first discovered that book. And those were, these were urgent matters then. Sure. Uh, the relationship of um, phosphates and fertilizers, the impact of it had on the soils, the, 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 what, what that sort of agribusiness does in terms of, um, does to the soil and what it does to our ability to have a varied menu. Have, um, you know, we, it predicted even then, it was a crisis even then that we were only going to be eating um, sorghum, soy, and corn. Mm. 
um, hybridized sor- sorghum, soy, and corn, mm-hmm. and, or hybridized and now GMO'd. And we didn't get into any of that um, uh, this day. Uh, we will in the future. There. Well, you just mentioned it now. It's in. It's in. Yeah, it's in the conversation. It's in the conversation. Yeah. I mean, there. There are many who suggest that some of the. Um, epidemic of things like celiac disease and uh, um, people who have reactions to gluten and yep. have trouble now digesting wheat. There are many. Uh, there's many who suggest that there's a lot of evidence um, supporting the um, understanding that we are eating different wheat now than we did back in the day. That the hybridized wheat which allows for yet another growth cycle is it looks we don't have any waving fields of of wheat in the midwest anymore they're short right it's like you know short fields stocky fields of wheat and that they have a different protein structure that uh, express different um, genes in in our dna and that those are uh, often gluten intolerant yeah yeah, so this is, uh, again, a broad conversation. There's so many different ways at it. You know, here's the bottom line. It's, it's, it's our conversation in that, uh, going back to this, do, do, uh, having domain, having a... Dominion. Say, dominion, forgive me, uh, over this versus... Being in charge of ourselves as opposed to being buckling down and being in control and efforting it, but just being in charge loosely by our it's a, how we hold it's it. A, it's a very complex world. You know, the more you know and the more there there is to take in, you have to have a consciousness that can handle it. And um, maybe we've always lived in complex times, but we do now. Uh, I, I don't know about always, but we do now. And so it takes a consciousness to navigate, you know, there are lots of um, pitfalls or lots of things to navigate in, in life. It, it is important to wake up, to be We awake become to. reactive. Yeah. So I think what you, a piece of what you're saying is that we have an opportunity now to be aware of what it is when something comes up, to notice what part of me is uh, in the flow with it. That's right. Or what part of me is reactive and is digging in heels, just to notice it, not to make it right or wrong, but just to notice it and to wonder, to ask, is that part of me really current or is that a part of me that is sort of a hand-me-down, has a hand-me-down belief system? Uh, is that a part of me that is that I'm hearing from that is from from how I was raised as a child and I'm digging in now and or is this a part of you know what what parts am I hearing from and so that I can make a choice to uh, fulfill the needs of that part love that part uh, be grateful for that part it got us here yeah and to put the uh, put put pop the stick into neutral around that part and make um, decisions and choices out of what is really happening in the present. So if there is a bottom line, and we're against bottom lines, but if there is one that we've made on this show and will continue to make, is it's per individual. It's each of us to own the reflection of the world that we're seeing and relate to it from the most empowered place, you know? And and that is the bottom line. And for it's, a per, us. it's a percentages game. It is. Uh, we have come uh, to the end of the game for today. We're 100% finished? Yeah, but we uh, invite you all to tune in again and keep coming back. It's a cutting-edge consciousness. Thank Thanks you. for listening.